Session seven, the final one. You guys ready? I'm fascinated by tattoos. I don't know what it is about tattoos. I don't know if it's the fact that I can't handle the pain from a flu shot, let alone being stabbed by a needle thousands of times. But as I'm getting older, I'm realizing like things, they're not as tight as they used to be. They, they get a little bit saggy. And so tattoos make me nervous because here's what I know about tattoos. You guys have heard me say this. A butterfly in your back when you're 20 becomes a buzzard in your crack when you're 80. So I love asking people about their tattoos, and so I'm at this, uh, I'm at this subway shop. Well, I won't point to it, because so the guy, you probably see him. And so um, I'm like, hey, well, tell me about your tattoo, and it says on there, um, I'm just a man, but he has it written backwards, so when he looks in the mirror every day, it reminds him he's just a man, okay? Listen, if you are a born-again believer, you are not just a man. You're a new race of beings that never existed before. You are now a hybrid of God inside of a man. You have been made one with the three-in-one. You have been enfolded into Christ like an ingredient into cookie dough. Your life is entwined with his life like a piece of rope woven together. You are a dispenser of the divine. You carry like Mary the Christ within and you will give birth to glory. You are the fiancé of Jesus. You are to never look at yourself apart from Christ because God never does. You are part of a terrorist training camp to destroy the works of the devil. God is making you a bride worthy of his son. If he told you and I not to be unequally yoked, he will not have a bride for his son that is unequally yoked. Oh. Ephesians 1.3 says that you have access to everything heaven contains. It would literally bankrupt heaven to give you one more thing because they already gave it all to you. That's just good news. So here, here's a question. If we've got all of this access to blessings, how do we receive the blessings of God in our life? Because here's what happens is we have a message that says, you're, you're blessed based on grace. It's all grace, grace, grace. You know, Jesus paid for all of it. And then we read verses like give and it will be given to you. If you sow generously, you'll reap generously. If you sow sparingly. So it kind of looks like we have a part. So how does this, has anyone else ever wondered, like how does this whole thing work together with giving and it not be works? Anyone wonder how this thing? So, here, so what's God's part and what's my part? Here's what I know. You don't want to confuse the two. You don't want to try to do God's part and he ain't going to do your part. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 gives the whole thing. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Everything you will ever receive from God is by grace through faith. I'm going to read the next verse to you. And, the, uh, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You are saved by grace through faith. You're not saved by grace alone, and you're not saved by faith alone. Different camps will say grace, grace, grace. Different camps will say faith, faith, faith. Um, they both have half of the equation. You're saved by grace through faith. Um, table salt is made up of sodium chloride. If you take sodium by itself, it will poison you and kill you in enough doses. You take chloride in enough doses, it will kill you. When it comes together, it forms salt, but it becomes an essential ingredient to your survival. Faith alone will not help you receive the blessings of God. Grace alone will not do it. It's by grace through faith. So let me describe to you God's part. I'm sorry, I'm still thunderstruck up here. I'm just... I'm about ready to do something. I don't know here. The Johnny be good. All right. Here's grace. Let me describe to you grace as it really is to finances here. Uh, Mary and I, we gave, our kids, uh, we gave our kids money for when they got good grades in the report card. And so when they got all A's, they got a certain amount of money. They got B's, less money. C's, they had to pay us money. So I'm like, listen, you guys are homeschooled. You, you should be getting good grades here. Okay? <clears throat> when it comes to receiving from God... Many Christians are approaching them with their report card, showing God how they've been doing, trying to receive based on that. That's called Old Testament law and dead works. It's called religion, and you will be depressed within two weeks, if not sooner. Here's the reality of grace, is I'm approaching God with Jesus' report card. And he got all A's, even on the advanced placement classes. When you begin to say unworthy, or I don't deserve it, you're using old covenant language which shows that you have not yet tapped into the good news of the new covenant. If you ever come before God with boldness because you feel like you've had a pretty good devotions that week, you're headed for depression because you're basing it on your effort and not Christ's achievement on the cross. Here's what the Old Testament law says. You ready for this? I will carry my end, and I will bless you if you carry your end, but if you fail, I will curse you. Everybody say Boo. That old covenant was made obsolete and a new arrangement between God and man was made. A new covenant. Here's the new covenant. This is God speaking. I will carry my end 
and then I will come and carry your end, and I will treat you as if you had carried your end yourself. Everybody say yay. yay. God says, I will carry my end, and then I will come and carry your end, and I will treat you as if you had carried your end yourself. God is saying, I'm not going to bless you based on your report card. I'm not going to bless you based on your performance. I'm going to bless you based on Jesus' performance. That's the gospel. That's the new covenant. That is grace. And the old covenant, um, someone, when they committed a sin, they would bring a lamb to the priest. The priest would inspect the lamb to make sure that the lamb was spotless. The priest never inspected the person. When you're approaching God, he is not looking at you to see if you are worthy to receive the blessing. He's looking at the lamb. And the lamb is perfect. Earning, deserving, I'm not worthy, that belongs to an obsolete covenant. You are worthy because you have been enfolded into Christ like an ingredient in the cookie dough. He looks at you through Christ-colored lenses. He never looks at you apart from Christ. He sees you are worthy to be blessed because you woke up breathing. Imagine that your great-great-grandfather is a gazillionaire. How about we just make it a billionaire, okay? He's a billionaire, and he has deemed it in his will that um, my grandchildren will all receive a $10 million inheritance the day that they're born. So the day you take your first breath, you're a multimillionaire. You don't then begin to try and earn it, which you got through a gift. When you were born again, you were put into Christ. It says you have access to everything heaven contains. The NIV says um, you receive every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You don't then, what you got through a gift, begin to try to earn it. That's grace. So here is grace for finances. Grace is what God paid for before you were ever born. It's the inheritance before you ever took your first breath, first breath of salvation. Okay? This is specifically for finances. This is what he paid for on the cross that you're now brought into. We've looked at some of this, but we haven't looked at it from the context of grace. You ready for this? 2 Corinthians 9.8. It's been one of our favorite verses here. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. There's actually something that was paid for on the cross that would abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. I've said it before. If this isn't true, John 3.16 is not true. Do you understand how good that is? Do you remember from our first lesson? We saw that there is no prosperity gospel, but the gospel includes prosperity. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And what's good news to the poor? You ain't got to be poor anymore. I know it's poor grammar. I'm making a point. We saw that financial prosperity was actually paid for on the cross for every believer, and he calls it a grace. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. We looked at it already. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus, this is what he did before you ever born again. This is the inheritance that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich in material wealth. Not so we can be selfish, but I'm not going to put limits on what, what, the, what the word rich means. Jesus became poor for three hours on the cross so that you and I, by grace, could be wealthy. I know it almost, the religious spirit has so twisted this thing, it almost sounds bad coming out of my mouth. Again, it is no more God's will for you to be in poverty than it's his will for you to be in adultery. He paid to redeem you from both. Dang. That should have blessed somebody. Grace. Um, since this is being recorded, I, probably everyone in here has heard this story, but I'm going to tell it again. So when I was uh, a little boy, I was probably like nine or ten, uh, my dad had this top drawer in his room, this, of this dresser drawer, and I loved going in that top drawer. He had all these treasures in there. And so he had this, this basket, and then it had things like cufflinks, like extra buttons, and he used to travel to different hotels, and they would give little sewing kits that had all, all these like, different color threads, he had like these um, like divot repair kits from golf courses he would go to and like extra tees and currencies from other countries and uh, coins and dollars and stuff like that. And I would go in there and I would just tie clips. I would just marvel at these treasures. And so uh, one day he went out of town on a business trip and actually uh, went into the top drawer and I stole some of the stuff out of there and I put it in my little top dress, dress drawer. And so I don't know what I was thinking, just you know, lusting over these things. And so um, a couple days later, my dad comes home from the trip, and he's tucking me in bed, and he starts looking for something. He opens up the drawer, and he sees his stuff in my drawer. And he's like, Jim, well, what is this stuff? And I'm like, Dad, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I stole this stuff. I, I know it was wrong. 
And he says, come with me. And he takes me by the hand, and he walks me into the bedroom. And I'm expecting a spanking. And uh, this is what he did. This, this literally happened, and it completely changed my life. He opens up the top drawer, and he says, son, everything I have belongs to you. Go ahead and take more. That's grace. You deserve a spanking, but you got a kiss. Guys, it ain't fair. My dad heard me tell this story, and he went, and uh, I think it was last Christmas, he, he bought a treasure chest, and he filled it with a whole bunch of treasures, things like tie clips and cufflinks and golf tees and currency from other nations. And um, I have it uh, where I get ready in my closet. I have it sitting right at eye level. So every day I get, get ready, I recognize, wow, this is, this is the heart of the Father towards me. This is the grace of finances of God who delights in the prosperity of his kids who's just waiting for people who get the religious spirit broken off them and the selfishness and the greed and all this stuff so that they can say, put your hand of blessing on me so people will see what you're like. I want people to experience the top drawer in their life. He literally paid for it as part of the cross so that you could live in abundant provision. That's grace. So, so what is faith? Faith is our positive response to grace. Faith, faith looks at grace and says, wow, that's for me. Thank you. That's what faith is. Faith is not what you must do to make God act on your behalf. We're simply responding because he already acted. God is no, listen, faith does not move God. If God has not already chosen to move by grace, then your faith can't make anything happen. Like you can't have faith to like grow wings and fly. That hasn't been paid for by grace. But there has been your abundant provision paid for by grace. Faith is your response to what God has already done. Faith is not what you must do to make God act on your behalf. We only need to respond to what he has already done. Okay? So New Testament faith is fixing my eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. And when I have true faith, something, that will, something interesting will happen. It will cause me to move into action. Faith without works is dead. James chapter 2.14. Okay, I want you to get this picture. My actions don't prove that I have faith. You can do the actions and not be in faith. Okay, so I'm saved by grace through faith, uh, faith alone, but that faith is never alone. That faith always has an action. When you truly see what Jesus has done, it's going to cause you to do something. Are you guys seeing the difference here? If there's fire in the, fire in the fireplace, there'll be smoke in the chimney. If there's faith in your heart, then there's going to be action somewhere in it. Okay? Sometimes faith looks like asking seeking and knocking. Okay? Sometimes God gives you a promise and he says you have not because you ask not. So sometimes you get a financial promise. We, we, um, God led us in a vision to go after a building downtown. We called it the Normandy building. And guess what? Um, we didn't get it. Remember we, And so what we do is we added a promise to a promise. We sowed a seed into that thing. I'm telling you how to ask, seek, and knock. We walked, we prayed, we got this thing, and it didn't go our way. And so we added a promise to a promise. We sowed a seed into that thing. Interestingly enough, um, I, I don't know why it took me until this weekend to put it together. My wife's like, ah, uh, yeah, I noticed that two months ago. Um, the finances of the church have increased 50% since we sowed that seed. That's it. Like, imagine, that's, that's significant. We had the largest offering we've had in the history of the church um, in the last two months. Like, like, I haven't been talking about money. I know I've leaked it out here and there a little bit. What's, what's happened is something, something was released when we as a church turned, remember we wrapped it in expectation, bursting with joy. We're gonna, I'm going to teach you how to do a seat here in just a second. But I want you to know, like, something remarkable has happened, okay? So I'm asking, seeking, and knocking. So uh, here's how it works, is God has given you a promise, and um, I'm not talking, you read a verse, and it's like, oh, I kind of like that one. I'm talking like there's life on it. You're reading it, and it's just like, there's something, something's in there. He's whispered it until the point where it's like a declaration. Like, this thing is mine. I'm not making it up. I'm not, you know, just saying things to say things. But you know what I'm talking about. When God speaks it, you know, like, this is mine. Okay? At that point, you begin asking. You begin walking the floors, praying in tongues or anything. I'm not trying to make it happen. I'm allowing God to change me to become the kind of person who can carry the weight of that thing. And the way it works in the kingdom is seeking is the thing that transforms you. You cannot replace the secret place. And it is walking the floors. It's praying over that promise. It's writing it down in a journal and, and just praying in tongues over that thing. God, I thank you. I'm aggressively thanking him for this. Not as some technique to get him, but because I can see it. God, I know it's on its way. 
I know that the answer is on its way. The check's in the mail, whatever that looks like is on its way. If it's not coming after a period of time, I will add a promise to a promise. I will sow a seed into that thing because we're going to show... Let me just cut to the chase. Here's what a seed does. A seed goes into your future and brings you the breakthrough that you want. Gideon has an encounter with the Lord. He takes bread and puts it on an altar. Fire consumes the altar. Remember this? He sows a seed of bre- He actually sows bread into this thing. Fast forward, Gideon, he's, uh, he's getting ready to face an army. God took him from 32,000 down to 300. They're getting ready to face this giant army. He's nervous about it. God says, oh, you're nervous about it. Why don't you go down to the camp of the enemy? God's strategies are weird. I'm already nervous. Now you want me to go down none, with no army to this thing. He goes down there. And he's over listening. And this guy's like, I had this dream. This tent mate's like, what, what was the dream? Um, there was this loaf of bread coming down the hill. He's like, that's nothing less than the sword of Gideon. We're, we're, we're toast. What did Gideon offer to the Lord back here? He offered bread. What was the thing that went into his future and became his breakthrough? I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking. I'm asking, it's not happening. I'm going to sow a seed. I'm not bribing God, but here's what's happened. Is, um, imagine shouting at the soil, give me vegetables, give me fruit, money cometh. Okay, the soil would say, um, hey, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if you understand how this thing works. You actually have to stick a seed into the ground. You got to water that seed. Okay, people are claiming it and naming it and screaming and blabbing it and grabbing it and doing all these things. And they're wondering why it doesn't work. It's because that's not how it works. By grace, God says, hey, here's this rich, fertile soil. It's called the kingdom of heaven. It's the financial, this is how finances work in there. And if you will take what's in your hand, and wrap it in expectation, bursting with joy, and sow it in tears. I'm going to talk to you about that in a second. Turn it into a seed, and you put it into my kingdom. It's, listen, a seed is not leaving your hand like a wishing well. Hey, I hope something happens. Pfft, probably never see that again. Uh, you can do that. It won't work for you. That's not a seed. A seed is something that's leaving my future, going into my future to multiply and bring me the breakthrough that I need right now. It doesn't make sense in the natural. It makes perfect sense in the kingdom. By grace, he created the soil. By faith, I sow the seed. So I'm asking. It's not happening. He's given me a promise. I know it's a promise. Guys, we have not done this as the body of Christ at all. We've given up after about two days. We're going to get good at this thing. Oh, man, we're going to get good at this thing. So I'm at, I got this promise from the Lord. It's actually become a declaration. I'm speaking it out. I'm asking. I'm adding a promise to a promise. And if that doesn't work, I'll go into fasting. I have not had great success in fasting in general for spiritual stuff. Um, but in fasting for specific things is where I can get excited about. And so I, um, if God will say, look, I can't fast for more than two or three things. I just, I don't have the, I, I, it's just too diverse for me. Okay, but if it's, uh, we're, we're getting close to the, um, we've sown a seed for Normandy building. I don't know when that thing's going to come. But uh, someone else is more than welcome to fix the place up before we get it. I'm well fine with that. Okay, but we're in this process with this. We, we've done it in our, in our personal life. But if fasting changes me, it doesn't change God. If you're trying to change God, you're in works. If you're recognizing God, this is how this thing works. <laughs> and so, Lord, I need to change so that I can receive this promise. And so fasting narrows my focus so that I become more hungry for your world than I am for this one. That's biblical fasting. I know I went off notes, but I think I gave you everything you needed. So here's what I wanted to do. Um, I want to have you practice asking, seeking, and knocking. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look back on the, um, I think it was the first exercise we did where we kind of did the mind bath. I want you to take uh, 30 to 60 seconds, and I want you to find a verse that stuck out to you. And I'm going to, um, and, uh, and uh, Josiah, I'm going to have you play music for three minutes. And I want you to begin to walk the floors. I want you to learn how to begin to ask God. I'm not asking. He already said yes, but he wants you to ask so that it's a co-laboring. It's a partner. God, you have put this in my life, and I'm asking you, make it come to pass. Make me become the kind of person. Lord, I declare this thing is true. You may even begin to feel an excitement bursting up and what it is that God wants to give you a revelation. Maybe there's a promise that he's made you that's in your journal. Maybe there's something you've been believing for that you want to just begin to enter this process. What am I talking about? Faith has actions. Now, you just walking around declaring doesn't mean that you have faith, but if you have faith, you're going to do some of this. 
Some of it may look like asking, seeking, and knocking. Some of it's going to look like you hovering over the chaos for that solution. That's faith. I'm expecting him to answer. New Testament seeking isn't looking for God. Where is he? New Testament seeking is he's in the room, and there's a strength gained from me looking, and I become the kind of person who can carry the answer. So where are you? What are you doing here, Holy Spirit? I know you're here. You never leave me nor forsake me. I'm not trying to get you in the room. I'm trying to get me into, into your, your flow. Okay? Take 30, 60 seconds. You know what? Just take five minutes and just do the whole thing. You're going to find something. I want you to literally get up. Boy, it's going to be crowded in here. We have 121 people. We were not expecting this, but I am so excited. So um, whatever you got to do, get up, walk around. I want... Play the music a little bit louder. I want you to be able to declare some things. You may feel your tongues go from that intimacy romance language to like the samurai warrior where it comes a lot more German. Shut up, you know, so just see what happens. You need to start somewhere. And so we're going to start here. I'm going to do one exercise and close it out. We'll be done. We'll be done in 15 minutes altogether. Five of them are right now. So Josiah, hit it. Get a verse. Get a promise. If you don't know what to do, just walk in tongues and pray over it. Walk in tongues. Just walk in tongues. That's what you need to do. This is our closing activation. We've got two or three minutes left. We're going to be ending early. You guys ready to encounter God in this one? This is going to be amazing. I, um, I put this in my book. I got permission from Stephen De Silva to uh, put this in my book. Uh, I stole it from him. So here we go. I want everyone to turn around and face the back wall and take out your wallets. Just kidding. That's a terrible joke. Terrible joke. I do want you to face the back wall. I'm going to, read, uh, I'm going to start off reading Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. So just close your eyes and just let this wash over you. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Apparently, God's got you tattooed on himself. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of lamp or light of sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever, end quote. The river of God is a picture of abundant life, supernatural provision, and prosperity. Everything good you will ever need or desire can be found in it. It runs through the middle of the street, giving everyone full access to it. All you need to do is learn how to get in its flow. So imagine you're standing in a river facing downstream, away from the throne. Behind you, God is placing good things into the river for you. Yet because of your position, you remain a spectator. You're watching the good things float past you just out of reach. Try to envision what some of those good things might be. I want you to speak this prayer out loud. Father God, I'm standing in the crystal river of heaven that flows from your throne. You fill this river with good things. But because I'm facing downstream, good things flow away from me. They are just beyond my reach. Too hard to catch. Lord Jesus, I want to turn. I want to see your throne. I want to see your provision. I want to turn around in Jesus' name. I want you to physically turn and face the front now. Now pray this. Thank you, God, that I am facing upstream. I can envision the throne of God and the Lamb. Good things are coming to me. The good things are everywhere. There's more than I can contain. There's abundance here for everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your eyes closed. Imagine what it looks, sounds, smells, tastes, and feels like to stand in the flow of this river's immeasurable abundance. There is no limitation. There is no lack. God places good things in this river for you and everyone connected to you.
His good things flow towards you and they're easy to catch. The new position you're in creates a new paradigm of expectations. You're facing the source of abundance and it drives away the fear, insecurity, and powerlessness you previously felt as you watch good things pass you by. But from this new view, you expect good things. You expect that every need will be met at the right time. You expect that nothing will be impossible. You know that everything in your Father's kingdom is yours. Amen. Thank you for coming to the seminar. I had a blast. I hope your life is forever changed, for real. I really hope it is.